We are starting a new series today, and it, call, it is called You Asked For It. Do you remember some weeks ago we handed out some surveys, and each of you filled in the kinds of questions that you have. You know, when, you, when you're reading your Bible and something is confusing, or you're talking to your friends and they ask you a question, and you're like, oh my word, I know I should know the answer to that, but I don't really have it quite there on the tip of my tongue. And you filled in a whole lot of topics that you found that you felt like would be useful for you to hear about. And in light of that, we have designed this series that looks like this. So today we're talking on is hell for real. So the most common question you all had was about heaven and hell. So we're going to talk about that today. And the second most common question, well, the rest are kind of all about equal. But you also want to know why would a good God allow bad things to happen? And that's a common question we inter when we interface with people in our everyday life. And, you know, they hear about the, the hurricanes and the stock, I mean, the, what do you call that thing, that stock exchange crash. <laughs> and they hear about recessions, diff difficult things happening around the world, terrorist attacks. And they say, if God is good, why do all these bad things happen? And you know what? We need an answer for that. Yeah. We need to be able to give them an account of a good God. And so we are going to tackle that question next week. Then we're going to be talking about something that's very topical at the moment. We're going to be talking about, can Christians be gay? Many of you have heard about the transgender issues that are in the news at the moment. Very um, high celebrity, well-known people going and having their gender changed through surgery and through taking of hormones. And, and now we have Caitlyn Jenner. And so then when we're interfacing with people, people ask us, you know, what does the Bible say about this? What do you feel about it as Christians? And, and we vacillate from, you know, no, not in this church, but I've heard Christian arguments that, that make us sound hectic, you know? They make us sound like we are the most judgmental, harsh people on this earth. And then, you know, I think, gosh, I don't want to be associated with that. But then, then you hear other arguments that make us sound like we have no convictions, you know, that man can just do whatever he likes and God just has to put a rubber stamp on it. And I feel like that's... A, that's another um, view that is just as, just as much I don't want to be associated with. So what we want to do is we want to make sure that as Christians we have the right answer, that we have, we have sought the Lord and we can answer in a way that's compassionate but is truthful. Right. That, that doesn't leave people deceived, but it also leaves them with a hope for a future. And then we are going to be looking at um, who cares about race. We live in South Africa, and if you haven't noticed the news lately, there have been a lot of racist remarks on social media and in various places, and that have kind of set the country just in a little bit of an uproar. And we want to answer this question. What does God feel about race? How do we handle this topic? And as Christians, what should our response be in light of everything that is going on in the nation at the moment? Because we want to be the answer. We want to be the people that in those situations have a word or have a way of speaking that settles the animosity and creates unity and life and blessing. Amen. Yeah. Without glossing over the very obvious problems that we faced as a nation. And then last of all, the, one of the questions you had is, are miracles for today? And oh my word, are we going to demonstrate that? <laughs> the answer to that one is yes. And we are going, we're going to talk about and give you a biblical response to that question. But also on that day, we are going to be praying for the sick. We're going to be praying for people who are in need of a miracle. I mean, we do it every week, but that week we're going to make a... a an extra focus on it, and we're going to leave more time for it. So what I want to ask you is if you have anyone who is sick, infirm, battling with something, please bring them on that day because, you know what, if there's no one sick here, we won't be able to demonstrate it. <laughs> so bring them. And if you're feeling sick that day, come to church. This whole series has been designed also to appeal to the kinds of questions that we hear out on the streets amongst people who don't normally come to church. So we're going to ask you to use this as an opportunity to ask people in your workplace, in your family, your friends, your relatives to come to church. We have little invitation cards. You would have received an invitation card. You can use that one or you can pick up some more at the info table and invite people. I was sitting at a coffee shop this week and I heard people having a conversation that related to one of these questions. I wasn't eavesdropping, they were just talking very loud. 
And so at the end of my coffee, I just turned to them and said, this might interest you. We're doing this at um, church and invited them. Just, you know, take a chance. Who knows what God will do? Amen. So take those cards and invite people. We're going to be having a really good time. So today is hell for real. Let's pray. Lord, Lord, we want real answers. Lord God, we want answers that mean something and that, that mean something to us, but also enable us to interface in a way with other people that they, they get it also. Father God, I pray that as I, as I speak, you would give me wisdom and you would give us all wisdom, collective wisdom to understand this topic and to be able to assimilate it in a way that is helpful to us and to people around us. Thank you, Lord. And all of God's people said, amen and amen. So you may have heard the story, but um, it is reported that Bill Gates died. He didn't really, but I have to say that for the story. So he died and he went to heaven. And well, he, and he's standing at heaven, the gates. And God says to him, well, I'm going to, you know, your life's kind of like in between. You've done some good, but also, you know, you've, you made windows. <laughs> you can see I have a Mac. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So he says, yeah, I tell you what, I'm going to give you a choice. Do you want to go to heaven or do you want to go to hell? So Bill Gates says, well, you know what? I, I, don't, know, I don't have enough information. So God says, okay, there, will, there, there are two computers over here. One will show you all about hell and one will show you all about heaven. I'll give you a few minutes. You can look at the two of them and then you can make your decision. He goes to the computer with hell marked above it. And oh my word, there's the pictures of this beautiful white beaches, fantastic crimson, I mean crimson, not crimson, um, turquoise seas, you know. Um, beautiful women and um, fantastic things everywhere. And yeah, and some handsome men as well. With great shoes, Mike. They've got great shoes. And he looks at them and says, oh my word, I never thought hell would be like that. And then he goes to the other computer screen and it's heaven and he sees a lot of angels and people playing harps and, and he thinks, oh, it's pretty, but I don't know about that. So he goes to God and he says, in light of what I've seen, I think I'd like to go to hell. So God says, fine. Off he goes, gets there and it's fire and torture and demons and chains and terrible and terrible, terrible. And God, after a little while, says, oh, I'd better go and check up and see how he's doing. Goes down, to, goes down there and says, so how, how are you enjoying what you chose? And he says, gosh, this isn't what that TV showed. I mean, that computer screen showed. He says, oh, no, no, that was the screensaver. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but there's, a, there's a really good point to this joke. And it goes like that. Many of us have kind of the screensaver view of heaven and hell. You know, we've heard the colloquial talk about, about hell. I have this friend or this person I know, she's, not, she's an acquaintance more than a friend. And, and she came to me once and she said, you know what? I don't know that I really want to go to heaven because all my friends are going to be in hell. Yeah, yeah, no, she actually said that out of her mouth. And, you know, I think she'd been looking at that screensaver, you know. And, and sometimes, sometimes, you know, we think about, you know, I've heard people say, I don't know if I want to go to heaven. It doesn't sound so great. You know, all those harps and clouds and those puffy angel baby things. You know, it's like, what am I going to do there? And, you know, I feel like society has fed us some screensavers. And... You can't make decisions on the screensavers. So we want to talk about, we want to just jiggle that mouse a little bit and see what's behind the screensaver. Um, how many of you have heard stories of people who've either been to heaven or been to hell? You know, they like were having an operation and they passed away and um, or some disease and they passed away and they were, they were resuscitated later, but they come back with these stories. And we hear them in the news all the time, you know, in uh, gossip magazines. They seem to have specialized in those. I have a pastor friend who's one of the pastors in his people here in Johannesburg. And, and recently he was having an operation and he died on the operating table, believe it or not. 
and they did resuscitate him. But what was interesting is before he went into this operation, there was a chance he wouldn't make it. So he'd, he'd kind of like settled everything, sorted everything out that if he didn't make it, the church would carry on, his family would be fine. And um, when, he, when he passed away, he went to heaven. And he described it to us, you know, with tears in his eyes. He was like, you know what? It was the most beautiful experience I've ever had in my life. I felt the most satisfied I've ever felt in my life. I felt so whole. Everything felt so real and true. Everything was just how it should be. And I'm so disappointed to be back. <laughs> he really said that. I mean, I think he's gotten over that now. I think when he saw his wife and children, he was like, oh, yeah, there's, there's some great things here. But nonetheless, you know, the description, you know, as he was describing it, he, he didn't go into much detail because he was like very emotional and he, he wasn't there for long. So he, he just really had a, a sense and a feeling of just light and beauty and grace and, and wonder. And, and as he, you know, as he was describing it, you know, something in my heart was just leaping. It was like, oh my word. Imagine living in that kind of environment for eternity. How great is that? There was another man. Um, <clears throat> you might know him, Kenneth Hagen. And before he came to know the Lord, actually, he died three times. And each time he went to hell. And then afterwards, he said, Lord, I want you. Don't do that again. I mean, it's just like being dunked in fire three times. And his description, you know, I actually went and I went onto YouTube last night and you can see it there and um, his, his description of it at home, I went, you know, something in my heart, I actually didn't want to turn the light out afterwards, I, was, I did it just before I went to sleep, don't do it before you go to sleep. You know, it just left me like, oh my, you know, you know what, I'll tell you what it did for me, I just was praying, I don't know how long, but I just the sincere intercession came over me. Lord, don't let anyone go there. Lord, I don't want anyone I know. I actually prayed this. I said, if anyone has even met me ever, I'm praying for that person. If I've been in a shop with them, I want that person. That not one of these people would go there because the horror and the torment and the terror of it was just overwhelming. There was yet another man and he, many thousands of years ago, was enjoying his time with the Lord. And suddenly he found himself outside of his body. And he was transported to heavenly places. And he sat there before the throne of God. And God began to show him how heaven looked. He saw Jesus in all his glory. And he says when he saw Jesus, he fell down on his face, trembling because the glory of who he was. And the magnificence and the power radiating from him was so incredible. And then God showed him what he was doing in his region at the time and all the churches and what God was doing in the churches. And, and he showed him about the wars and different things that would happen. And finally, near the end of this experience that he had, God sat him down and showed him the great throne and showed him the end of the world. His name was the Apostle John, and he wrote it down in a book. And that book is called The Revelation. It's the last book of your Bible. You can go and read it. It's fascinating. But this is the part right at the end of the book that he spoke about his experience of what God showed him would happen at the end of time. He said this, Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it and Death and Hades gave up the dead that were in it, and each person was judged according to what he had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. I said that lake of fire thing very many times. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with, ma with men, and he will live with them, they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. Yes! <laughs> Doesn't that sound great? 
You know, this new Jerusalem, it goes on and describes it. And, and a lot of in the revelation is not literal. It's, it's kind of like a picture of, of some things that would be very hard to describe. But literally the size of it would fill up. It's, you know, we think of this little city coming down on a hill or something. But the size that is described will actually fill two-thirds of the United States of America. I mean, it's just, it describes streets of gold, the glory of God resting there so that they don't even have to use lights because just the glory of God is everywhere, that, that there's no sickness and disease. Everything is glorious and fantastic and blessed and, and amazing. But what I want to do in the light of this passage, it, it brings up some things. It, it speaks about some things. It, it speaks about a lake of fire which is our traditional view that we have of hell. It talks about a place called Hades. Now, what is that? Is that different from hell? And then it talks about heaven, and then it talks about a new heaven. And so I want to just take a little time as we begin to define some of these terms for you so that when you get questions, you actually know what the Bible says. Oh, sorry. There's more. It's more good news. <laughs> he carried on and he said, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Yeah. Good stuff, huh? Yeah. So let's define some terms. The first thing I want to talk about is Hades and heaven. Remember he said that um, death and Hades would be thrown into the lake of fire. How many of you have this picture of hell where... Th- the devil is standing there with the keys and he lets you in or out and then he's in charge. And you're all looking at me like, what is there anything else? <laughs> Here's the good, well, good news, bad news. I don't know who, depends which, where you are. <laughs> the devil's not in charge of Hades. He's not in charge of hell. He's not in charge of anything. He doesn't want to go there. The whole of history is him trying very hard not to go there. Trying to twist history so that he gets the upper hand. Well, guess what? We know it's not going to happen because we've seen. If he doesn't want to go there, you know what I'm saying? Then we really, really, really don't want to go there. But Hades is an interesting thing is it's a, it's a concept, and it's often translated hell, but it, it actually is a little bit different from that. Jesus talked about it in a parable in Luke 16. He talked about the fact that there was a man called Lazarus who was a beggar, and he was, didn't have much, and he had sores, and he said the dogs came and lit the sores. So in other words, he's really in a bad way here on earth. But when he died, he went to, he went to paradise. And that is, that is the heaven that... As Christians, we will all go to. It's where people who believe in Jesus Christ and believe in a God who saves us go to when they die. It's the experience of goodness and and bliss that this man that I was telling you about this pastor experienced. But he says there was there was another man who would pass by this beggar, a wealthy man, and would just take no notice of him and disregard his state. And even though he was very wealthy here on earth, he went to a place called Hades. And he said it was tormenting and terrible and awful. And throughout the Bible, the, 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 the Bible talks about things like the church will prevail against the gates of Hades. And what's it it's talking about? It's talking about a place that people go to when they die, when they haven't trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ for their salvation. They haven't exercised faith in God. But guess what? It's not hell. It's only the first step. It's terrible. It's bad. It's a place you don't want to be in. But guess what? It's just a holding place. It's a waiting place. Remember when Jesus was on the cross, there was a man dying on a cross just next door to him. And that man um, had a conversation with Jesus. And what did Jesus say to him? Today, you will be with me in paradise. What was he talking about? He was talking about this place, this both good and bad, Hades and paradise. That when we die, we go either to be in the presence of God that is beautiful, it's paradise, it's fantastic, it's an expression of heaven. Or if we have not 
exercised faith in God, we go to this place called Hades. Because our lives have said we don't want to be with God. And God, in his glorious wisdom, choo chooses to honor your choice. But it's not the end. It's not the end. Because remember, in that passage, John saw that death and Hades was thrown into something. So let's look at the lake of fire. Another way of saying it is the Hebrew word Gehenna. Can we all say Gehenna? And this is the biblical word that we translate hell. Jesus spoke of it. He talked about it in Mark 9. He talked about it as a place where the worm is never satisfied and the fire is never quenched. Now, I want to ask you a question. What do you think it would be like to live in a place where there is just no God, where there is nothing good, where everything good has been removed? I want to ask you this. How many of you enjoy being hungry? Me not. How many of you enjoy a good meal? Tasty food. Where God is, there is food. And I've heard it has no calories. It's just great. Broccoli tastes like ice cream. <laughs> the Bible says that everything in, that is good emanates from the heart of God. Now, I want you to imagine being in a place where there is no food, there is no taste, but there is hunger continuously, never, ever ending. How about desire for physical intimacy with another person? What if that craving and that lust was there, but the good part, the actual physical relationship, wasn't there? In a way, other words, you could crave all you like. You can never get it. Because sex is good. It's not going to be in hell. What about never-ending thirst and no beautiful, clear water to satisfy it. You know, I don't know if it's literally going to be a lake of fire. I don't know if there are literally going to be worms there and fire, but this is what I know. Every craving will be there and no satisfaction for eternity. Never, ever, ever ending. Okay, let's pray. <laughs> Who doesn't want to go there? <laughs> but you know, that, that screensaver view, you, you know, I just want to turn to that lady who said that to me and say, maybe your friends will be there, but there will be no friendship. There will be no way to relate. Because the goodness of what you're experiencing in those friendships won't be there. That'll be in heaven. Awesome. You, you're doing well so far. <laughs> now we get to the good part. Everyone breathe a sigh of relief. That's over. <sighs> John wrote about this new heaven coming. Have you heard about the resurrection? Jesus was resurrected from the dead. He got this, he died and he was resurrected and everyone saw him, touched him, felt him. And it's spoken about in the Bible a number of times that he was the firstborn in resurrection. What is it talking about? It's, we, we are all going to go to this heaven when we die to be with Jesus. But there is a time coming when books will be opened, when judgment will happen, where God will sit on his white throne, if that's what it looks like, and he will open books, and everything that you have done in your life will be laid bare before everyone. And there will be a book of life for those who have said this. 
I don't think that I can be good enough. So instead of be choosing to be judged by my works, I'm choosing to accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior so that I'm not judged by my works, I'm judged by my faith in Him. And then your book, then your name gets transferred from that book where all your works were written. It gets transferred from there into that book of life. You want to be in the book of life. Because we're going to talk about some things later that will make you see that, you know, that, that weighing up good and bad. Is my life more good or more bad? That, that stuff is just impossible to win. That game, just you can't win it. But it's talking about this state, like it says, the sea gives up, it's dead. Everything gives up, it's dead. Do you, do you remember that in the passage? What's it talking? It's talking about the resurrection at the day of judgment. I want you to know this. You get a new body. All of us sitting in that paradise, you know, and it's a body with no aches and pains, no creaks, no groans. Everything works. No gray hair, no saggy, anything. And at this resurrection, it says, this is the glorious thing. It says heaven comes down to earth. That's what it's talking about, the new Jerusalem. It's everything about the goodness of God. His rule, his reign comes and resides, bam, on earth. There is a new heaven and there is a new earth. And there's this glorious reign for eternity where heaven and earth are unified and become one. And you get to live in the presence of God and eat mangoes. (laughs) And build nations and do stuff. That harp singing on clouds, you know what? I don't know where that came from, but it. It's not there. We can get rid of that screen saver of heaven. We do stuff. The Bible talks about us ruling cities and ruling nations. It talks about us governing in the kingdom, that the kingdom just takes over everything. In the spirit realm, but in the natural as well. How's that? Does that make you happy? It's a good plan. It's a good plan. There's a... That's when I went to heaven, I just drew that picture quickly of the new Jerusalem. (laughs) You all got it. I want to take a little moment to define sin and righteousness for you. The Bible actually has four words for sin. And sometimes we look at God as being a little bit of a killjoy. You know, that's, that's why my friend wanted to go to hell, because you felt like in heaven you couldn't do any of the fun stuff. But, you know, God's not like that at all. When we define sin, the Bible says it means to miss the mark. It's like God put a big bullseye up there, and in the middle is everything good. It's your successful life, satisfying life, glorious relationships, incredible blessing. And we pull back our bow and arrow and take our best shot and bam, miss it every time. Another word for sin means literally offense against relationship. It means God... God puts up some fences around this field and he said, you know what, if, if you want to be in relationship with me, stay out of this field. You can go everywhere. Look, those forests, those mountains, go everywhere. But this little four by four field here, you just stay out of that. And you know what it's like inside of you if you're told you can't do it? Ah, I'm going to try it anyway. Best way to get sales of a book up is to ban it. And you walk and you climb over the fence and bam, you take one foot and you realize, oh my word, it's quicksand. And as you're being pulled down under the mud, you're going, oh, I should have listened, I should have listened, I should have listened. And the next one means to twist or distort. It's often translated iniquity. 
And what it means is to take a good thing and make it bad. It means to take something like authority and turn it into a dictatorship. It means taking something good like parenthood and turn it into abuse. It means taking something good like sex and turning it into rape. It's taking something good and twisting it so that it's bad. And the last one is guile. And it literally means to present yourself as something that you're not. That's pretty hectic. Is there anyone here who has not done one of those at least once in their life? If anyone raised their hand, I'd be saying, hello, Jesus. <laughs> it's a pretty comprehensive list. At the same time, if we want to define righteousness, because often we have this, this thing that there's this this wild and terrible and difficult standard that God's wanting me to meet, and I have to work really hard to get it. But I want to give you the good news. You can't. (laughs) You can't meet it. I want to give you this analogy. A father who's six foot high goes to his four-year-old son who's three foot high and says to his four-year-old son, unless you're six foot, you're worth nothing to me. And the three foot little four-year-old's like, oh, I've got to grow, 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 grow. And then the father smiles and says, here we go, picks up his three foot son and puts him on his shoulder. You're six, you're nine foot now. And really, that's a picture of God's righteousness, is that there is, is a standard that you cannot meet. But guess what? He picks you up and puts you on his shoulders, and guess what? You exceed it. And all you have to say is, yes, God, I want it. And all this trying, trying, trying to be a good person. It's just not going to get you there. Rather, lift up your hand and say, Dad, I need your righteousness. And that righteousness looks like Jesus. It looks like a surrender of my own fighting to be good enough, fighting to be the right kind of person, fighting to win, pushing people aside so I can get my way, conniving and presenting to people an image that I think they want to see. It's putting all of that aside and saying, God, here I am just as I am, three foot high. I can't be six foot. Pick me up so I can be yours. Amen. So it means, righteousness means to meet God's standard. And there's only one way to really do that. It's through the grace and blessing of and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It means to maintain relationship. Righteousness means that I do any, everything to maintain relationship. You know, there are some times in my life that I don't want to be nice to Andrew. <laughs> yeah, there are times, there are, really, there are really times when I just want to tell him, no, go your own way, I'm lying here and reading a book. Bam. And there's some things I want to say worse than that. I want to confess. Now, I'm just, I'm not doing that sin thing of pretending that I'm not. But you know what? I don't say and do those things. I'll tell you why. Because I value the relationship. And I modify my behavior to maintain the relationship. Thanks, God. Yeah. (laughs) I still want to be married to him next year and the year after and the year after that and the year after that. So I put my grumpiness down, and I smile and say, oh, you want a fried egg for breakfast? Lovely. (laughs) I do that. (laughs) And you know, there are times in my relationship with God (laughs) that I don't want to read my Bible. You know, that I... I don't want to be a good person. I don't want to smile at the taxi who's cut me off. I don't. (laughs) 
I don't want to be nice to that grumpy person ahead of me in the line. But you know what? I want God's presence more than I want that momentary satisfaction of grumpiness. So I modify my, my attitude for the sake of the relationship. Amen. Righteousness means to think correctly. I love this. The Bible says that we will know the truth and the truth will set us free. The majority of our pain, anguish, hardships, anxieties come because we're thinking wrong. And the glory of God's righteousness when he picks you up and puts you on his shoulders is this, that we get the mind of Christ. We see things from a new perspective. When that taxi driver cuts me off, I no longer see a... uh, so I'm going to say this word. I was going to, well, I was going to say it. No. I no longer see a... <laughs> you know what I was going to say. Okay. I no longer see that. I see someone desperately trying to make a living for his family and he's got to get everyone. He's got to get in 10 trips today and he doesn't have the money to fix his van and he's just got to do this thing. And I can see the stress and anxiety in his life and my heart goes out and say, Lord, save him too. Amen. Gosh, that was close. I felt myself on the slippery slope. And then, I know you're all curious, what was she thinking? You know what I was thinking. You think, you think it too. <laughs> and then, righteousness means to be authentic. Guys, listen to this. It's so great. You want it. You want it. Imagine being able to be entirely yourself, always. And what if yourself could always be good? What if? And that's what the gift of righteousness that God comes to give you is. That now Christ is living inside of me and my goal is no longer to try to be good, it's to try to be me. It's try to release that goodness and that grace of God that is inside of me to the people around me. It's to stop the lies and the, the, the wrong thinking and the bitterness and the anger and put that aside and say, that's not me. Who is me? Jesus Christ in me, the hope of glory. His nature, his way of thinking, his power, his, his hope radiating from me. And I can pull off those silly masks of insecurity, of hopelessness, of small-mindedness of fear, of self-preservation. I don't have to live with that stuff. I don't have to make the person next to me do what's right or make amends where they've hurt me. I don't have to do that anymore because my righteousness is this. I'm living in so much blessing that even if you try to hurt me, you can't. I can live in that kind of freedom. How many, I, I have to ask this before I say it, but how many of you have heard me tell the story of the courtroom scene with um, the murderer? Just raise your hand. Okay, fantastic. There's a new audience. <laughs> can bring out my old, old stories. <laughs> so, someone you loved is brutally murdered. And they catch the guy. Mike is protesting that it's a guy that did it. Okay, they catch the person. (laughs) They catch the person. And they bring him before the court. And he's tried. And he's so obviously, he, he, she is so obviously (laughs) guilty. And you're sitting at the courtroom. And you hear the verdict that your judge gives this person is guilty. And something rises up in your heart. Yes, justice has been done. And then, lo and behold, the the judge turns and says, but I know this person's father, so I'm going to let him go. Let him, her go. What are you feeling at that moment? Mad. 
This is corruption. This is not justice. Yeah. You're going to, if you don't know how to toy toy, you're going to be toy toying outside of that courtroom. Why? Because mercy without justice is corruption. In the human heart, there is a cry for justice. Why? Because we made an image of God and God is a just God. And sin is not just not meeting a standard, it's a violation of relationship. And when we sin, we violate something. And if God were to forgive you of everything you've ever done, just a blanket forgiveness, what would that do? That would say to everyone that you've hurt that you are more important than them. That the pain you've inflicted in their lives doesn't matter. And God can't do that. And you know, when we see that courtroom scene, we very, very often put ourselves in the place of the victim. It's very easy to play the victim. All these bad things that have been done to me, all these other people need to get justice. Pay for what they've done. But the truth is the majority of us are victims of something. But we're also the perpetrator. And there's not a person in here that 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 list of sins, you couldn't say yes. And God can't make everyone else pay for their sin and not you. We'd like that. But God can't extend mercy until justice is done. If the judge in that courtroom then said, you know what, I'd like to set you free, but you've committed a murder, and I can't do that. So I tell you what, I will find someone to pay for your crime. And the murderer says, well, my brother will do that. And the brother comes forward and the judge looks through all the reports and he sees, oh my gosh, the brother's murdered someone himself. He turns to the brother and says, you certainly will receive the punishment for murder, but it won't be for your brother, it'll be for you. (laughs) The judge would have to find someone who had never committed a crime. Because otherwise they'd be being punished for their own crimes. Not for your crime. And he searched. The Bible says he searched to and fro for a man who would do this. And he found none. Because his desire was to extend mercy to you. And so he had to find someone who would take the consequences of your and my sin so that he could give us righteousness as a gift. And he couldn't find anyone, so he said this, okay, my arm will save. I will humble myself and I will go and I will be a man and I will live a perfect life with no sin. And then I will offer to stand in the place of every person that has ever missed the mark. And I will will be justice for the world so that God can extend mercy to everyone. You know, on that great final day of judgment, when the books are opened, your book, your name will be in one of those books. It'll be either in the book where all your deeds are written, and God will judge you according to whether you've done right or you've done wrong. And he will be a fair and righteous judge. And at the end of that, he will put up the standard of Jesus Christ. And he he won't say, Oh my word, look at these terrible things he's, you've done. He'll say, 
What did you do with the mercy I extended to you? What did you do with the mercy I extended to you? And perhaps you will say, I didn't really believe you existed and I chose to live my life myself in charge of my life and I want to still be in charge of my life and you know what he'll say great we won't say great I'm sure there'll be tears in his eyes and he'll say I give you what you desire and there is a place where his presence doesn't dwell and the Bible describes that as a place where fire isn't quenched and the worm isn't satisfied and he will say I grant you your wish to live apart from me because the choices we make in these, this life are not just choices for now they're eternal choices they're eternal choices or your name will be found in the book of life and, and you know what the truth is there will be people in the book of life who've done bad things but they're saying, God, don't judge me on what I've done and what I haven't done. Judge me according to Jesus. I acknowledge that I've messed up. I've done wrong. I haven't lived perfectly. And in that, I ask for your mercy. I ask for your mercy. And he'll say, I give you your, your wish. Come into Come into the eternal dwellings of my kingdom. Come into the eternal dwellings of my kingdom.